The Afghan American Chamber of Commerce serves the interest of its members through numerous programs, advocates for a free and open market economy in Afghanistan, and endeavors to strengthen U.S.-Afghanistan economic relations. AACC's annual U.S.-Afghanistan Business Matchmaking Conference is the world's leading event for promotion of the private sector, business matchmaking, and investment in Afghanistan. AACC works to ensure that Afghanistan's economy and employment of the Afghan people remains a top priority for the U.S. and Afghan policymakers and serves as a link between business and government to encourage progressive economic policies that will result in increased business, job creation, and investment between the U.S. and Afghanistan. We believe that peace and stability can only be achieved in Afghanistan through the success and growth of the private sector. It is the goal of AACC to promote the exchange of information and provide resources to its members through investment conferences, seminars, networking events, publications, and other avenues to stimulate U.S.-Afghanistan business and investment. The Afghan American Chamber of Commerce Facilitating U.S.-Afghan business, investment, and trade ties. Well, since we have a great uh, panelist, so let me, let me just go before uh, making any other comments. And it will be, uh, of course, a continuation of yesterday uh, speakers, which uh, speaker after the speaker, they uh, spoke about the importance of investment in Afghanistan and uh, how rewarding it is. And of course, uh, we put together a great panel. It's a very diverse panel, and about the, uh, mainly they're talking about energy, energy development, energy infrastructure, how to access finance for investment, and also extractive precious stone. Um, so it is my honor to the beginning, if I could introduce uh, Mr. Christopher Clement, Director. International Affairs Simmons Corporation. What a wonderful, so the Simmons name in Afghanistan is a very well-known name, so I think that was perhaps one of the first uh, English word, if you could call it an English word that I learned in Afghanistan, Simmons. So, so it's been, uh, it's a very long-standing uh, relationship with Afghans. So uh, he will speak about Simmons' vision for energy development in Central Asia, including Afghanistan. You're welcome to come here, or if you want, discuss from there. Okay, thank you. I know we had a compressed uh, networking session, um, but uh, I think that uh, AACC and, and Jeff have done a really good job of setting up a continuum of uh, discussions here and panels. And, and you know, I think the, the last session we really saw uh, what the appetite is for deals currently in Afghanistan. And so I'm, I'm just picking up on that and, and taking Siemens' uh, view, which is a global view, and talking about how we see opportunities in Afghanistan and Central Asia today uh, and also into the future. Um, and I think, you know, uh, I'm biased, but, you know, Siemens is a pretty good company to do that because uh, we've been in the energy business um, and doing deals globally for about 170 years. Uh, we've been in the United States uh, for 160 years. Um, and so it's just a pleasure to be here today with uh, you all at AACC. So uh, first I just want to give a snapshot of, of Siemens in the United States. Uh, we do about $5 billion a year in, in U.S. exports annually, and uh, each year we invest about $1 billion in U.S. R&D. Uh, and Siemens has invested about $40 billion of foreign direct investment in the United States over the past 15 years. And so we, we are uh, very uh, happy and heavily invested in the U.S. market. 
My job is to leverage Siemens government affairs relationships in the United States uh, to win U.S. infrastructure deals that create export opportunities for Siemens 50,000 U.S. employees uh, who work at 58 manufacturing sites all over the U.S. And uh, in terms of specific opportunities for uh, Afghanistan and Central Asia, uh, we, we see broad-based economic opportunity that's really buoyed by uh, demand for uh, oil and gas as well as uh, metals uh, from China and India. Uh, the Asian Development Bank forecasts that uh, Afghanistan will realize 3% GDP growth in 2018. Neighboring countries in Central Asia and South Asia, which have the strongest trade ties with Afghanistan, uh, they're expected to grow at 3.9 and 7% respectively. And then if you look uh, slightly farther afield, but certainly in the same neighborhood, India and China uh, are forecasted to have 7.3 and 6.4% uh, GDP growth. So this is a, a pretty good neighborhood uh, to be in in the world from a GDP growth perspective. Um, and you know we at Siemens we really view ourselves as a technology partner for Afghanistan's development uh, when they are ready to take that step. And for Siemens uh, the first step we believe in the development process is access to energy. Uh, reliable energy uh, that is produced within Afghanistan. Um, as we heard in the previous uh, panel discussion, uh, it's true that Afghanistan has a lot of work to do in terms of connecting more customers to the grid, but the grid itself has made great strides in the past 10 years in terms of uh, interconnecting the four main grid structures around the country. And that's really uh, helped uh, support resiliency of the grid, uh, and it's actually made for a better uh, offtake market for private power investors in the country. Um, and uh, since most of Afghanistan's electricity is imported today, it's really critical that, that the generation capacity be expanded within the country. Um, and Siemens believes that access to reliable electricity is the cornerstone to society's growth. It facilitates economic development, uh, telecommunications, and the provision of essential civil services such as security, food supply chains, and education. In Afghanistan, Siemens hopes to implement its expertise in power generation and distributed energy solutions. Um, and specifically, we, we really uh, believe in, in the scalable uh, approach within Afghanistan. Um, we're very happy to be working with Bayat Group um, on a, a generation capacity project. Uh, as that project is, is hopefully brought online, uh, that will create uh, more growth, economic growth opportunities. It will enable larger scale power projects to come online. And all of this will incentivize further uh, investment. And that's just a first step. Siemens is also a techno technological leader in smart grid technology, which facilitates the two-way flow of energy on the grid. It's that technology that enables industrial parks, for instance, to develop their own power generating capacity and then sell them onto the national grid. We manufacture wind turbines, transformers, battery energy storage, and digitalized grid solutions. Uh, and we do all of that here in the United States. And this lowers the cost of uh, power in Afghanistan. Uh, Siemens also manufactures medical imaging and diagnostic equipment, building technologies that lower the energy consumption of the entire of entire city neighborhoods, large-scale conveyor belt systems for the mining sector, and rail signaling technology that ensures efficient, safe freight rail networks. All these technologies are relevant to Afghanistan's future stages of development. In a recent speech, our global CEO Joe Kayser said that corporations have more obligations than just to their customers, employees, and shareholders, and they must bring value to society. Uh, and this is really sort of the core of, of our fabric at Siemens. 
uh, because we do have unique technological solutions uh, that uh, deliver uh, economic growth opportunities to countries at every stage of their development. But for Siemens to engage, uh, we need uh, more opportunities. Siemens is a technology provider. We're not uh, the leading investor in these projects. Um, you know, we, we note the good work that USAID and other foreign aid agencies have done, uh, particularly to develop civil society in Afghanistan, uh, focusing on SME, market development, rule of law reforms, uh, financial sector, uh, structuring to really help uh, the private sector enter the market and uh, we hope put reliable energy onto the grid in Afghanistan. And uh, we really do, uh, like, like the, uh, the video in the previous uh, session, I mean we really do see tremendous opportunity for Afghanistan to grow uh, quickly and to become a leader uh, within the region. Um, so that's sort of uh, me just kicking things off. Um, that's our, our big uh, picture view, uh, distributed energy solutions and scalability of opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Very informative. And of course, uh, we'll ask you some questions and, uh, after everyone completes their presentation. We'll go to our audience, and uh, they will be also asking questions. So uh, let's go to our next friend. Uh, uh, it's uh, let's see, Abe Goldschmidt. Is that right? Yes. Uh, so Abe is from OPEC. OPEC is very popular in Afghanistan, so they bring a lot of money, and they are really uh, finance some of the projects in Afghanistan. I hope that was successful, and I hope you open your pocket to assist us also in the future. So. Thank you, Saad, and uh, thank you to Jeff for uh, putting on such a wonderful group of people here, and for all your time and dedication to the cause, and uh, OPIC is proud to, uh, to be represented here today, and uh, I'm proud to say that OPIC is uh, certainly open for business uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, I'd like to give everyone here a brief overview of what OPIC does and our um, capacity and exposure in the region. Um, OPIC um, is the U.S. government's primary development finance institution. We support U.S. businesses across uh, the world. Uh, we're currently open in um, about 100 countries uh, with about $21.5 billion in, in exposure um, against our $29 billion dollar, um, uh, capacity, so we do have uh, a lot of room um, to move around and, and to play with, and Afghanistan is certainly a uh, priority country um, in the United States uh, in the current administration uh, for foreign policy and national security reasons. Um, so OPIC um, provides three products. Uh, the first of which is uh, debt finance, which uh, is our most uh, popular um, and um, um, uh, product, uh, currently with uh, 16 uh, and a quarter billion dollars in, in exposure. Um, traditional financing uh, tied to, uh, to the 10 year treasury, uh, favorable rates. Obviously, OPEC does not come in uh, where other commercially viable and private sector uh, financing opportunities exist. Um, another product that we offer is on political risk insurance, uh, which has also been uh, an area where we've been active in Afghanistan as well. Um, provides uh, insurance against the risk of expro expropriation, war, uh, and violence. Um, for obvious reasons, um, it is critical for U.S. companies to um, have assurances that their investments and, uh, and, and products are going to be guaranteed um, in country. Uh, and, and a newer product that we've offered in the last uh, 12 years or so is on the investment fund side, um, where we go in up to 75% of, uh, of a fund. We don't have any equity authority, so it acts more like debt. Um, not as popular um, in the Afghan market, uh, but it's a, it is um, uh, an available uh, product. Uh, some of our uh, criteria for eligibility um, 
includes uh, obviously a commercially viable business plan. Um, we uh, have a requirement that there's a U.S. nexus involved in, uh, in all of our uh, projects. Uh, so uh, that could be a little more flexible depending on uh, the countries and regions, but typically it requires about 25% U.S. Uh, participation and ownership uh, or management uh, in any of the, the uh, companies that we're, um, that, that we're going to go alongside with. Um, and obviously what I've mentioned uh, earlier is that uh, we cannot displace any uh, private sector um, uh, financing or insurance. Uh, so there, there needs to be guarantees that that's not available, and, uh, and that's often the case uh, in, in countries such as Afghanistan and, and emerging markets where OPIC is uh, active. Um, we'll move on. OPIC's been open in Afghanistan since 2005. Uh, with a total exposure of about $175 million across a wide variety of sectors, including microfinance, uh, the apparel manufacturing industry, hospitality, and housing. And uh, it's not to say that there haven't been any uh, challenges. Um, uh, in the main, uh, OPIC uh, operates um, you know, with a less than 1% uh, default rate. Um, that obviously is, is not the same country by country, uh, so we are diversified uh, globally. Um, but when we do look at opportunities in Afghanistan, uh, we uh, we are cognizant of the fact that uh, that there are challenges, um, and, and we're willing to mitigate those risks in, in uh, a variety of, of fashions. Um, we have been, I'm proud to say. Uh, in early stage talks with with the buyout group, and uh, we're hopeful that uh, that, that uh, we can form a partnership there. And uh, the energy sector is, is an area that OPIC is uh, uh, very interested in uh, in supporting, uh, as well as uh, on the uh, extractive sector. Uh, and just to reiterate what uh, I, I kicked off with, OPIC is certainly open for business. Uh, we're looking for the right opportunities. Um, and we will review any and all opportunities on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and just uh, once again, wanted to thank uh, Jeffrey for putting this on, and thank the, the buyout group and Chris uh, as well. Um, all of you, and look forward to, uh, to increasing our portfolio uh, in Afghanistan. So thank you. Thank you. It was great. Uh, so now we go to Mr. Bismillah Khuram. He is uh, in Atra. He's an Atra board member, and his topic of uh, discussion will be after as a U.S. telecom investment opportunity. Thank Mr. you. Khuram? I will speak from the note. Please. Thank you so much, and first of all, I would like to thank uh, our friend from the Afghan American Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Jeffrey, and also Mr. Lutfi, for organizing such an important events for the last 13 years. I'm very thankful from Mr. Jeffrey uh, because uh, during the award of the fiber license, uh, they have been helping us a lot. When we send the uh, fiber RFP uh, to them, they have sent it to many American investors. As a result of that, uh, we have uh, awarded to American uh, company the fiber license. And I also see a very uh, active participation of our friends in the ISP sectors like Talia and uh, Zohar and Prolink. Uh, and these are the very tangible outcomes for the telecom sector in Afghanistan. Private sector in particular, the telecom sector has been always the uh, top agenda of the President uh, Ashraf Ghani, and he has always supported the private sector, especially the telecom sector. And he, we and ATRA and the President uh, always welcome any uh, suggestions 
recommendations in this sector. The door of ATRA has been always open for consultation. As, as a result of the consultation, we have amended the law in order to pave more ways for private sector, especially the telecom sector, to invest in Afghanistan. Overall, five GSM and one CDMA operates in Afghanistan. Total investment in this sector is 2.5 billion. Uh, and total internet traffic is 48.1 Gbps and the usage is 47.5 Gbps. Total telecom subscribers are about 23 million active SIM card and 3G subscribers are 5.8 million. Total internet subscribers are about 8 million, that includes the Aminos and also the ISPs. OFC rings length over 3,200 kilometers in 22 provinces of Afghanistan. And over 120 million is invested in this project. Landline subscribers are 113,000. Total direct job in this sector are 150. As a regulator, ATRA treats all operators equally and there is no discrimination between the Afghan telecom or our other immunos that are on private. Based on act open access policy, after there is no more monopoly the market on fiber because we have awarded four companies the fiber license which is <coughs> AWCC, Solat, ACG, and Roshan. Over five years, this four company has committed to invest in this sector 38 million in fiber. Also about 100 million in near future will be invested in 4G in this sector. We have also connected all the uh, universities, uh, government universities and the internet and 150 schools are already connected into internet and we have in pipeline that to connect 250 schools. We are also looking for innovation solutions that we have received from Talia, we have received from Milad, and from your colleague. We are also looking from other ISPs uh, to pro give us a solution for how to uh, connect these schools into uh, internet. We also work with the government ministries such as Ministry of Higher Education, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Public Health and IDLG. In near future, over five years, all the provincial level and municipality will be connected to fiber and their communication will be smooth with the central offices. What opportunities are available in this sector in the future? We have fiber, which is a great opportunity for uh, investment and also MNP and ISP and also vast services. Uh, thank you so much. And we, I don't want to go into detail because the chairman, Azizi, has covered most of the topics yesterday in his presentation. Actually, he did. Thank you. And uh, we're going to go to our uh, video. And uh, one of our uh, panelists, uh, it's uh, Mr. Let's see, Asif Stanikze. Uh, he was not able to uh, come to the U.S. I think he was at a visa, visa issue. Perhaps he applied at the last minute. Uh, but anyway, he has sent us a video. And uh, I'm going to ask our uh, audio tech friends to just uh, go ahead and play that for us. With the vision of positioning Afghanistan's unique marble and granite within the international marketplace for high quality stone, Natural Stone Processing Company has invested precious Afghanistan capital in the hope of fulfilling this vision. Our journey started in 2014 with a feasibility study. 
Following this in-depth research, our founders and investors traveled to Italy to build the largest, most advanced stone processing company in Afghanistan. It would be world-class, truly competitive in both the regional and international marketplace. The company, with decades of experience in construction and trading within Afghanistan and Gulf countries, purchased ultra-modern Italian machinery and started the design and construction of two modern stone processing factories in 2015. Our two modern factories were designed by a world-class professional Italian stonemason and stone processing design expert who specialized in industrial construction and engineering. The plants were constructed to European environmental standards using modern construction techniques and equipment. Since this time, Natural Stone Processing Company has maintained a strong focus on innovation and unwavering attention to detail and quality. To achieve this high level of performance, the company remains committed to hiring and training the best employees in Afghanistan, with a strong commitment to the environment and Afghanistan's natural resources. As a result, Natural Stone Processing Company is positioned to be the largest producer and exporter of Afghanistan's marble and granite to the international marketplace. We are Natural Stone Processing Company the leading company within Afghanistan's marble and granite sector focused on mining, processing, and finishing of marble, onyx, granite, and travertine. Now, 95% of this unique, world-class project is completed, and we are proudly announcing that our production will start in August 2018. Both factories are equipped with the most advanced Italian machinery with a production capacity of 60,000 square meters of stone slabs and tiles per month. Quality will meet international standards for local, regional, and international markets. Careful loading and unloading with gentry and overhead cranes with different capacities will guarantee quality control. Natural Stone Processing Company has also invested in an automatic water treatment facility recycling water for marble and granite cutting and polishing. Three gang saw, three multi-wire, and five automatic block cutting machines cut blocks of precise thickness, 10 millimeter to 60 millimeter as per our customer specifications. Four automatic Italian calibrating and polishing machines for marble and granite with imported abrasives gives the best possible finish to the slabs and tiles. Three bridge cutting machines, one manual polisher and profiling machine, one edge polisher, four single and multi-desk cross cutter, one splitting machine, two camphoring machines, and other small machines and equipment guarantee a superior end product. Natural Stone Processing Company has set the benchmark for the mining, processing, and finishing of Afghanistan's precious and high-quality stones. It is committed to forging a world-class standard for Afghan stone processing by carefully harvesting these precious stones and processing them professionally, so each stone comes out as a work of natural beauty, truly representative of the Afghanistan nation. To minimize waste, we use advanced machinery for both mining and processing and reuse the process waste for strips, handcraft, aggregate, and mosaic tile. Natural Stone Processing Company will sell the finished slabs and tiles to local markets through regional sales offices and to global markets through our international sales in Dubai. Natural Stone Processing Company has five key advantages over all competitors in Afghanistan a world-class standardized factory utilizing advanced Italian machinery, diamond and abrasive tools that produce standard size slabs and tiles, water recycling system, and a waste reduction process for both the mining and processing phases. Positive impact on this project, job creation. We expect to employ 500 direct hire employees and our activities will support indirect job creation of an additional 1,000 workers. Women's employment. We expect that the vast majority of our operations would require male employment due to the difficult nature of this stonework. But Natural Stone Processing Company is prepared to commit to hiring at least 20% of new employees to be women over the next three years serving in our marketing, sales, administration, and handcraft departments. Positioning of Afghanistan's unique marble and granite as a high-quality, competitive product for sales and exports in national, regional, and international markets. 
increase government revenue through royalty and domestic tax revenue mobilization. At Natural Stone Processing Company, we deliver beauty through natural and superior stone processing. At the Natural Stone Processing Company, the pleasure of living is found in the beauty of our stone. Please visit us at www.naturalstone.af. So I just wanted to add there on behalf of Asif Stanakzai, Asif could not get a visa in time. Uh, the, him and his partners have invested over $8 million in these two modern uh, production facilities. They own leases on quarries in Afghanistan. They have some of the highest quality granite, marble, and travertine in the region. Their goal is to service not just the Afghan market, but to do exports too. Uh, they have done this all through their own private equity investments, but what they're looking for now is partners that can help them, whether uh, banking or institutional or government partners, that can help them to facilitate their exports to the region itself. And so Central Asia, Dubai, UAE obviously is a big target for them, but you can see they've invested a ton in this work. Um, the palace, uh, last two weeks ago, invited them uh, and a group of other uh, stone uh, companies to make formal presentations to the High Economic Council about these investments and about what they need. And they had a very good session with the president. They're very proud of what they've already done. And in August, they start full production. Uh, I'm sorry he's not on the panel today, but uh, we promised him we would show the video and represent him today. So thank you. Jeff, thank you. Uh, now we're going to go to... Uh Christopher Hick, he's a friend of mine also. We worked together uh, for a couple of years at least. Uh, I think it was uh, 2012 for uh, TFB. So. And uh, Hick is very smart, of course. And uh, he's going to be talking about how to access finance for investment in Afghanistan. And I'm sure you would have a lot of questions for him. All right. Christopher. Is it working? The mic is on. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I think it was successfully, we've transitioned now from the morning to the afternoon here. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, President Grieco and the entire Afghan American Chamber of Commerce for the opportunity to participate in uh, the conference and in today's panel. Um, it was great here to hear from the uh, great uh, to hear from the diverse lineup of panelists here uh, in this session um, covering the Afghan government, financial institution, and equipment manufacturers. This dovetails nicely into the topic that I've been asked to speak about, which is how to access finance for investments in Afghanistan. So, uh, in regards to Assad, uh, Assad and I met actually in 2009, so uh, I'm actually a little bit older, <laughs> than, uh, I think, but Assad was the first Afghan, uh, uh, um, uh, first Afghan I met when I arrived in Kabul at that time when we started TFBSO, uh, at that time with Ambassador Eikenberry, I think it was. So, um, again, it's a, a pleasure to see so many familiar faces in the audience. I see Deputy Minister Sadat there, who I've known for several years. Uh, so, uh, welcome to Washington, D.C. again. Um, and I've been, you know, personally involved in, in uh, you know, again, I said from 2009 in Afghanistan, and now currently in my consulting firm, EMI Advisors. Um, most of the time that I've been in, in Afghanistan uh, structuring uh, deals in the hydrocarbon um, and energy sector, have not been sitting in, uh, uh, you know, behind an embassy compound on a military base, uh, not running financial models in New York or London. It's been actually out in the fields in the northern portion of Afghanistan, um, looking at the infrastructure that uh, was in place when the, so uh, that the Soviets had left in place. So natural gas fields that were taken into production that are still viable, pipelines, gas processing facilities, um, you know. So a lot of this involved working with Afghan government officials and finding creative ways to restart the gas-fired uh, power industry in the country. Um, so currently I do the same thing in my uh, similar type of work in uh, my uh, consulting practice. Um, EMI advisors uh, providing frontier market infrastructure, project development, investment uh, support to governments, private firms, and financial institutions. Again, most of our work globally has been focused on energy, telecom, and financial infrastructure uh, sectors. In Afghanistan, the main activity has been in the gas to power sector. Um, 
the value proposition that we bring uh, to the table here is in developing and de-risking these infrastructure projects to ensure that they are bankable and they can attract the financing that is available, both equity and debt. Um, uh, let me step back to something that uh, um, uh, Chairman Emeritus uh, uh, Don Ritter brought up earlier. You talked about the 2010 reports uh, on the estimated vast mineral wealth potential in Afghanistan. So at that time, there were reports about a trillion dollars of mineral wealth. And that was actually a, a bit of a, a blessing and a curse for Afghanistan. Um, and uh, the, what, what happened there is many projects were kicked off or envisioned that were too big, too complex, uh, took too long, required too much financing for Afghanistan at that time. Um, and the smaller projects that were being looked at that were actually quite viable and could have gotten into production in the short term were actually overlooked at that time because everyone was trying to chase the big elephant in the room at that time. Um, you know, so a, a lot of that was un, unrealistic. So for years I've watched uh, similar panels um, on Afghanistan and other frontier markets where government, government officials would talk about these large opportunities, private sector uh, firms would talk about uh, large projects they were envisioning, and then they would all look to the financial institutions to provide debt or equity financing, and they would all go off down this path, but they'd never get to financial close. You'd talk about them for years later, and they were still trying to get to financial close on these projects. Uh, the, the net result of this is uh, 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 they never went into commercial operations and the projects got uh, shelved again because they're too big, too expensive, um, and they weren't designing the projects around the financing that was available. So, the, you know, yesterday we heard, you, you know, the, the way that, uh, that I've looked at these transactions in the past is instead of actually trying to financially engineer risk from one stakeholder to the next, you're really operationally engineering risk out of these transactions and finding ways that you're going to get to financial closure and commercial operation faster on smaller scale projects that you know are scalable. Um, so it was refreshing to hear a common theme yesterday uh, from uh, a common theme yesterday of starting small. We heard this first from Michael Stanley from the World Bank. Uh, he spoke about starting small and growing incrementally over time provided us some examples in the mining sector of, uh, in South America. And we also heard from Dr. Bayat in his keynote speech where he talked about starting small, scaling quickly, failing fast, uh, and investing in America and Afghanistan, and his example of how that worked uh, in the mobile telephone sector. So th those applications are actually very applicable uh, today. So. Um, you know, with the, the panelists we have here that cover each one of these, when you look at a uh, an infrastructure deal in Afghanistan, you're look you have stakeholders that involve Afghan government officials, uh, Afghan or international businessmen, uh, infrastructure and equipment manufacturers, development finance institutions. This has to be, these deals have to be win-win for all of them. If it's not, if one of them is assuming more risk than the others, the deal never goes anywhere. So. It's a pleasure to be on a panel with this diverse makeup of this so we can get into a good Q&A session to talk about this. Uh, we all know that the road to economic independence in Afghanistan is tightly linked to, uh, to increasing jobs in the agriculture sector, uh, the ag sector through exports um, and revenue through the development of the extractive sectors. Without domestic sources of reliable low-cost energy um, in Afghanistan, these sectors have no hope of really moving the needle in Afghanistan. So uh, again, I, I see what we are starting here today, in, uh, starting here in 2018 um, with the energy projects that are being discussed right now with, uh, with the Afghan government um, and the equipment manufacturers and the development finance institutions. This is going to be the 2012 that Dr. Bayat started, the, the, the 2012 that was created in the mobile telephone sector, 2018 should be the same point for the uh, domestic power generation sector in Afghanistan. So, and with that, um, I guess my, my final comment on is I was asked today to talk to you about how to access finance for investments in Afghanistan. I would actually say we turn this upside down a bit and say, how do the stakeholders work, to work together to develop projects that can best access the finance that's available? You can't change the financing that's available, but you can design the projects to access what is already exists there today and then grow this afterwards.
thank you very much for the opportunity to speak on the panel today. Well, excellent. Thank you very much. Chris, let me start with you. Uh, you know, the Afghanistan government still, you know, we're working on capacity building to help our folks to understand how to develop RFP, particularly which is important for all of us sitting in this room. Have you experienced any problem or do you have any suggestion with the uh, department that you've been dealing with? Yeah, I mean, I find, you know, a lot of times when you start with the typical RFP process, information flows one way. So that works great when you're in a developed market. Um, it works great when, um, uh, you know, you have something that you're very sure you know what you want. Um, but that's not the situation you're in here. You're building the, the car as you go in Afghanistan here. Mm -hmm. So um, it takes all of these stakeholders getting together and, and, and trying to figure out how to best de-risk this. And what I found refreshing over the last uh, year is the Afghan government through DABs and uh, uh, the, the PPP team have been receptive to feedback on these power projects. I mean, uh, I've watched the stakeholders push back um, and, uh, you know, the, there's a different model that's sort of, uh, that's developing here. So it's, it's, it's quite interesting to, to see this and excited to see these transactions go into uh, commercial operations soon. Okay, excellent. Well, um, you are helping the buyouts, is that right? Sure. Yeah, I'm involved in the, the, this transaction part. And you have a consultancy. Uh, we heard a lot about buyout, which I'm very happy and very encouraged. What are the other Afghan companies really just uh, would you recommend for investors here to team up with and they have the same capacity or capability that Bayot has? Yeah, I, I mean, when you look at this here, I, I mean, I see the cell phone industry was started by Dr. Bayot and this grew to many other, you know, Afghan businessmen. So, you know, Mr. Gazanfor is working on a power plant mm -hmm. project also here in Afghanistan and there's many others that are being, the, 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 that are being discussed now here also. So, you know, there's a lot of capital, Afghan capital, that's sitting outside the country right now. Many uh, Afghan businessmen were quite successful in the security business and the transportation uh, business uh, over the last decade. Um, once these initial projects are successful, you're going to start seeing some of that capital and some of those businessmen coming back saying, hey, I want to be part of this, you know, the next phase of this energy sector. So rather than I being identifying two or three here, I mean, I think we need to look at, you know, who is the whole population of them and how are we making sure these initial transactions are successful because everyone's watching this. When these transactions are successful and the government is getting revenue from this and the, uh, you, you know, we're seeing the needle move away from 90% of the uh, energy is in, uh, imported from the country and it's going down 89 and 88 and 87, you're going to start seeing that money come back. And it's a combination of that money coming back being uh, combined with uh, you know the likes of Siemens and uh, and others and uh, and the other uh, development finance institutions that will allow you to de-risk these deals. And uh, touch yeah, I just want to hop in here. So I mean, just to unpack a bit what uh, Chris, great name, different spelling, uh, is <laughs> saying. Um, I mean, uh, really, project finance deals are exciting because of their flexibility. And uh, the reason project finance works, of course, is because all the parties in the deal ideally are working transparently with each other and they are, uh, as a group, identifying, uh, assessing, allocating, and then managing risk. And so um, Chris you know, mentioned the many parties that are in a deal. Um, it's often the same number of parties that are in a small deal versus a big deal. Um, and so the, the key here is to really identify which party is responsible for which risks. And then that enables uh, government instruments such as OPIC or uh, technical assistance from ADB or the World Bank. Those tools can then be deployed in a very strategic way uh, to help the deal get across the, the finish line. And then that deal, if it's successful, is then a template for future deals. And that uh, helps the market grow. It helps to lower financing costs because there's a proven track record or model of how to do similar transactions. And, and all of this leads to a larger pipeline of bankable projects. And I think you know, that's really what everyone is, is looking at Afghanistan for. When, when is that 
inflection point going to occur? And as Chris mentioned, a lot of the money that's on the sidelines uh, realizes that there are real opportunities here. Um, you know, investors who put cash into a deal, uh, they need assurance of repayment. Uh, project developers, they need to be able to ensure uh, those risks, both during construction and the operation and maintenance phase. And this is how you, you move uh, the, the ball down the line, so to speak, uh, step by step. A couple of quick audience questions, Asad, is that okay? Of course it's okay. Uh, but I was going to ask him one more question before we go to the audience. Uh, you are very much interested as a Siemens to just uh, uh, do work in Afghanistan, helping us in Afghanistan. But in the meantime, you are kind of hesitant. Hesitant in, in a sense, you know, you mentioned about the, uh, the, the energy shortages. And also, uh, are there any some sort of regulatory uh, problems or is there something Afghanistan government can do to really attract uh, foreign investors? Yeah, we, we don't see, I mean, we're not uh, hesitant. We're, a, we're the technology provider. Yeah. So, you know, we're bringing uh, 170 years of experience and expertise, uh, but ultimately we need to get paid uh, when we do that. So we see huge opportunities in Afghanistan. Um, and uh, one reason we see those opportunities um, and, and we're thankful to be working with Chris and the buyout group because we are aligned on those opportunities. It's that uh, we have unique product offerings that, that allow us to provide uh, gas turbine power uh, at relatively small levels, uh, you know, 44 uh, megawatts. That's the A45 uh, fast power plant that uh, takes two weeks to set up. And... Uh, connect to the grid and it's providing uh, power very quickly and we also have intermediate size uh, turbines and and uh, best-in-class HH class uh, turbines which are 560 megawatts um, and so we we see because we work with utilities globally we see uh, that you need to have uh, proven revenue streams uh, to invest in future growth. You know, when, when we're doing projects in Africa, uh, which has a lot of grid connection challenges, we are often going in early as a consultant, helping uh, the, the utility to understand what their commercial or technical losses are. And if we can assist with fixing that, that helps increase revenue, which then enables... Uh, enhanced bankability of future projects by that company. So it's, it's, yeah. all, um, it's all a process and, and uh, you know, we see the steps that, that lie ahead for Afghanistan when we're eager uh, to be present in that market. Thank you, it's very helpful. Quick, uh, we have a quick comment or question from Joel Allen at Talia. Uh, Joel Allen, Talia, Afghanistan. Uh, just a couple comments, one general and maybe one more specific. Uh, first of all, I don't think it's been emphasized here enough that the, the inf information communications technology sector cuts across all, cuts across all uh, sectors and is a catalyst and facilitator for all, all the industries uh, we're talking about here the last couple of days. Uh, second of all, specific to the to the ATRA uh, support that we've received uh, uh, on our QUICA uh, initiative in Afghanistan. Uh, the Chairman Azizi, I guess he's not here, but uh, Board Member Karam, uh, Vice Chairman Celeb have all been very, very accommodating for us to uh, be receptive to getting uh, no cost to the consumer internet capabilities to rural schools. Uh, facilitated our discussion with the Ministry of Education on specifics of what requirements they have. It's, I won't say a 180, but a quick, a very turnaround situation with the regulator in helping us from going from an application for licenses to now being a licensee looking for support from the local government, national government. Thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, general comment is that there's a maturation process happening on the regulatory side that I think is very different than it was a few years ago. 
and companies like Talia and other companies that are here are very supportive of that and uh, having a good regulatory partner uh, in the Afghan government. We appreciate it. If I could ask one question for Beshmila, if I could, while we have you here. So uh, we're hearing a lot uh, in the U.S. market about what China is doing on the ICT investment side in Afghanistan. The Iranians are doing a lot on the Herat uh, side of Afghanistan, not just in ICT, but in other areas too. Um, there are, you know, the Russians now, I understand, have uh, some of their IT companies set up in Kabul and incorporated and stuff. So what should, I mean, uh, in the end, Afghanistan will need all partners in different sectors, and they're, they're going to be welcoming to all partners. I, we get that. But how is it, how should U.S. companies compete against maybe state-owned companies that are getting major subsidies for their programming in a market where we want to really compete in a free and open market space in Afghanistan? Are there things that you look to as a regulatory body to help make sure there's an even playing field in businesses that are coming in to invest? Thank you, Mr. Jeff. Uh, since the market is open, free and, free and open, so we have the Hawaii and ZT that they are uh, mainly working with all operators. And they have, uh, I guess, uh, very cheap equipment that they're providing for these uh, companies. So these companies are mainly looking after uh, those equipment from the China, which is close uh, to borrow to Afghanistan. And we have always uh, uh, supported and welcomed the U.S. companies also to come and invest, and we will facilitate any, uh, uh, any and pave the way for them, and we'll be happy to help them to come to the markets. Okay, great. Mr. Horam, um, I mean, the U.S., at least the Defense Department, which we were part of it, they spent $2.5 billion, and uh, Afghanistan... <laughs> Sorry? Go ahead. In Afghanistan technology, oh, Afghanistan. And, and, and that's where ATRA is at this point, or, or Ministry of uh, Information Technology. And now we are giving business to like Chinese and Russian and all those things. I was wondering how much China, Russia, okay. Iran invested in Afghanistan uh, um, yes. uh, okay. I'll ask you. You know, IT infrastructure. Uh, they are mainly providing the equipment and uh, like uh, all the s system that the companies, all the mobile operators are using, they, they do uh, use those uh, uh, items in their uh, uh, companies. But uh, as far as the U.S. companies, uh, since they are uh, very far and uh, there is no uh, uh, agency or uh, franchise over in Afghanistan so that uh, we could uh, also facilitate this uh, uh, investment for them also, but uh, we are, like I said, here to uh, facilitate uh, all the uh, challenges if there is any, and we mostly welcome them to have a franchise in Afghanistan so that we can promote their uh, uh, service or equipment in the market also. I had one question brought to me by a prospective customer for Siemens, Chris, not to put you on the spot here. He wanted to know uh, can you discuss about the efficiency of Siemens gas turbines? He said you would know what that means. I do not. So. Yeah, so that's uh, how much of the energy goes to power generation. So the A45 uh, uh, is at, f at f roughly 40% efficiency, um, which is the highest in its class amongst competitors um, in, in the fast power segment. And it, it runs on natural, natural gas. It can also run on LPG. Um, and again, the beauty of it is that it's, it's uh, uh, packaged here in the US, uh, manufactured, packaged uh, in Houston. It can be flown on a plane. Uh, the trailers come off the plane, and it's driven to the site. Um, and within two weeks, it's, it's kind of modularly put together. And then uh, it has very fast startup time to reaching its full efficiency, about eight minutes. So um, it's, it's a great product, and, and we're very proud of it. Um, and then as you move up to larger turbines, they become more efficient. Um, and that's, that's where you know, there are, again, future opportunities, I think, in Afghanistan in the years to come. 
All right. If you find me afterwards, I'll introduce you to a possible Great. client. All right. Asad, can we wrap up? Are any further please. points? No. Uh, we're, oh, but Dr. Sarush has a, a quick question. question. Yeah, please, Dr. One Sarush. One second. We're up against our lunch break. We're ready to go. I'll be very, just on OPIC, uh, just a very quick point. Um, in the case of Afghanistan, when it comes to investment promotion efforts, uh, the role of catalysts and enablers uh, uh, remains uh, very crucial. And in the case of uh, OPEC, uh, in our view, um, the level of uh, investment facilitated by OPEC in Afghanistan remains minimal. Uh, and we believe that given the, the great potential that exists in Afghanistan and also the great uh, resources, uh, technical and financial resources available within OPEC. There is, um, I think, a great potential in terms of having a greater role by OPEC in facilitating investment uh, uh, promotion activities in Afghanistan. And we are very much hopeful that we'll witness uh, a, greater, a greater role and engagement by uh, your institution back in Afghanistan. The feeling, the feeling is mutual there. Have yeah, okay. Congressman Dan Rada, please. Um, OPEC had what they call an uh, on-lending facility in uh, Afghanistan. Mustafa Kazim, who was with this conference many times, was heading that up. Oh, I haven't heard you speak about it today. Does it still exist? At what level? What's the status and what's their plan? I think you're, ref you're referring to Afghan growth finance. Um, yeah, Afghan growth finance. So I think yeah. that, that dates back to 2010 or so, uh, which significantly predates me. Um, are they still, but, but are they still operating? Um, I, I, I believe that the commitment was around 10 million. Uh, I don't know the status of it right now. Because that facility, uh, for those of you who are investing over in Afghanistan, Afghans, you don't need the 25% U.S. component. Correct. That's already taken care of. But, and, and that model has been successful across the world. And uh, Yeah, so that's, that's a very important. If you could get back to Jeff or us uh, sure. as to what the status of that is, we'd be very appreciative. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, we have some good news in that our keynote speaker right after lunch is Greg Huger from USAID who is going to talk about a new partnership between OPIC and USAID on a number of investment uh, areas, one of which will be uh, a new possible new financing facility. OPEC has really pivoted uh, under the new administration to be much more involved in Afghanistan investments. They've ramped up the number of meetings they had directly with Afghan companies and American companies. Remember, there is an American quotient that has to be in the deal. So they are very aggressively looking right now at a number of sectors for investment in Afghanistan as opposed to the previous years. So we're very glad that Abe's there. He is our, our new John Aldonis. Many of you have come to our conference before and John had been here for many years uh, presenting and Abe is our new John Aldonis for Afghanistan. So thank you so much. This panel was great. Asad, great job. Yeah. We're going to take a one hour break and then we will come back for our keynote right at 145 with Greg Huger from USAID. Thank you.